This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. How bad is climate change? Just Asking Questions. I'm Reason Senior Producer Zach Weissmuller, joined by my co-host Liz Wolf, Reason Associate Editor and author of the Reason Roundup. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. So people are freaked out by climate change, especially young people. Scientists for Nature conducted a survey of 10,000 16 to 25 year olds in 2021 and found that 59% of them were extremely or very worried about climate change. And large majorities reported that climate change made them feel sad, anxious, and or afraid. On Earth Day this year, President Biden shared a picture on X of himself standing next to AOC with the caption, Young Americans know that the climate crisis is the existential threat of our time. They deserve leaders who believe them. Today's guest says it's time to stop catastrophizing. Ted Nordhaus is the co-founder and executive director of the environmental nonprofit, The Breakthrough Institute. He recently published an essay in The New Atlantis titled, Did Exxon Make It Rain Today? which argues that while climate change is a real phenomenon affected by human activity, we're actually safer than ever before. He says a deliberate campaign of fear-mongering and exaggeration about the effects of climate change have misled the public and damaged the credibility and effectiveness of the environmentalist movement. Ted, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Let's start by talking about the fact that young people are scared, anxious, and depressed about climate change. Should they be? Uh, Well, you know, uh, from what I can tell, uh, at least a certain class of young people seem to be, you know, scared and and anxious and depressed about almost everything. Um, And climate change Mm -hmm. is one of them. Um, And, you know, you can go whatever. You can go, you know, read people like John Haidt and be like, it's all their phones or, you know, I and I um, I cannot begin to tell you what's going on. But certainly I think climate change has been one of the things that uh, ways in which that sort of anxiety and depression and what's ever going on with a lot of young people has manifested itself. Um, And, you know, uh, I think that has uh, a lot to do with what we've been telling young people about climate change. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of what we've been telling them is wrong. Um, Sorry, go ahead. When did that narrative sort of start or take hold in your assessment? Um, You know, I think if you kind of go all the way back to when sort of climate change sort of first enters um, the sort of public consciousness, um, you know, I think there's been a sort of series of kind of ratcheting up of sort of very catastrophic or apocalyptic claims about uh, climate change. Um, But I think, uh, you know, um, you know, I I think it's safe to say that there's certainly an inflection point when Al Gore publishes an incon or uh, um, makes the movie An Inconvenient Truth. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's a a, a real kind of um, sort of mania um, around that movie and around Gore, um, uh, that then, um, you know, almost immediately collapses, um, uh, you know, in part because of the financial crisis and suddenly everybody had much more pressing sort of apocalyptic concerns, um, to worry about. Um, and then Obama gets elected and everyone is like, Obama's going to make everything good and he's going to solve all the problems. Um, and then I think, you know, the the other kind of critical inflection point is that, you know, during the first two years of the Obama administration, um, the effort to pass a cap and trade uh, bill, which is like the first really big effort to do a sort of economy wide um, carbon um you know, sort of regulatory policy fails. Um, you know, they pass it in the House, um, it never even comes up for a vote in the U.S. Senate uh, because a lot of Democrats uh, in the Senate um, rightly figure out that, uh, you know, it's going to be attacked as a carbon tax and they don't want any part of it. Um, and then Democrats, uh, you know, kind of lose a, a sort of landslide 
uh, you know, midterm election uh, in both houses of Congress. Um, and that was sort of the end of the cap and trade effort. And the lesson that the environmental movement takes away from that is that they were sort of too focused on sort of inside the beltway kind of policy and politics. And they hadn't built enough of a, so they didn't have enough boots in the streets. Um, and so that's when you start to see, I think, a real kind of ratcheting up of a lot of the really sort of apocalyptic and very confrontational rhetoric around fossil fuels and around climate risk. You, uh, Bill McKibben goes and launches um, the sort of effort to stop the Keystone Pipeline. Um, there's a, a very conscious effort to make climate change sort of a litmus test issue, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the way that, say, um, you know, kind of uh, opposition to abortion has become uh, in the Republican Party uh, within the Democratic Party. Um, and they largely succeed at that. Um, and, uh, you know, alongside that, and I kind of document this quite extensively uh, in the article, is that the Union of Concerned Scientists, the organization that ostensibly advocates environmental policy sort of uh, in the name of scientists who um, are looking at these environmental crises, sort of holds a series of workshops and, and and launches a sort of decade long effort um, to uh, connect um, current day extreme weather events to climate change um, in uh, ways that actually really uh, ironically can't be supported uh, by any well-established science at all. Um, I want to bring, I bring up this uh... sort of history of this and kind of everything that we see today really is just a kind of um, extended, you know, the, the extension of that. Well, so it's so interesting. I mean, this is a relatively recent phenomenon. We're talking about in the roughly last 15, 20 years that this has taken hold in American politics to the degree that it has. Um, you know, was, was this sort of inevitable, uh, as we, we rolled, uh, into the early aughts? Or is there a different and better way this could have transpired? Well, I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, people, institutions, leaders always have choices. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in some sense, you get into these various, you know, call them epistemic or cultural or political bubbles. And, um, uh you know, I, I I think that a lot of environmental leaders generally genuinely believe that we're in the midst of a, a, a crisis and an emergency, even if they kind of know that they're sort of fudging a little bit on the actual facts, because there's a sort of an ideological view, you know, sort of posture at the bottom of it. And that ideological posture is that nature is this very fragile thing that exists you know, in this, in, in a state of delicate equilibrium and balance. And that if you change it too much, if you disrupt it too much, really terrible things will happen. So I think yeah. at the bottom, you know, sort of implicitly, there's a, I think there's a view that, well, you know, even if we're kind of exaggerating about like whether the most recent hurricane really was a, had much to do with climate change, we know that this is going to be really, really terrible because of the way that we're sort of changing the Earth system. Um, so it just sort of becomes a kind of almost a sort of tautological thing um, that sort of mm. rationalizes actually kind of misrepresenting a lot of the science. At the same time, mm. we have You're really, that, that... really clear evidence for a long time that the actual strategy, which is to try to get everybody freaked out about climate change, doesn't actually work. And this is like from the environmental movement's own research and going back again, multiple decades, we know this. So, uh, you know, there was a choice here and the choice was to sort of double down on the catastrophe um, to kind of try to sort of scare the public straight um, yeah. about climate change and the belief that this would result in sort of sweeping um, policy. And you can go back and you can see that even, you know, we don't need that, we can or cannot get into this. Um, 
But even on its own terms, if you went back and said what they actually started on, which is they're like, we couldn't get a price on carbon with this inside the beltway strategy. So we just need to build this movement that's going to demand um, in a way that sort of the political system can't resist um, a price on carbon. I mean, this is literally, it's all quite explicit. And, you know, you get that movement now taking credit for the Inflation Reduction Act and all the money that Congress spent. But the irony is that this was the thing that they said would not work. I mean, Obama actually uh, appropriated a ton of money uh, to invest in clean energy uh, through the American Recovery and um, Reinvestment Act uh, in 2009, which they said, well, this is just window dressing and we have to have carbon regulations or a price on carbon or none of this means anything. And so we're gonna go scare everybody and freak everyone out to go get it. And so then you get Biden with the Democratic Congress, um, you know, more than a decade later, finally, you've got a chance to really do something. And Biden, not, nor congressional, won't even touch a carbon tax, won't touch any actual <laughs> regulatory policy. So if you just go back and go like, what was supposed to happen as a result of getting everybody freaked out about this, it abjectly failed. But of course, you know, the, the, the environmental movement is sort of it's it's become this sort of self-licking ice cream cone where you know it is it is it has to be it is just you know um uh um the only conclusion one is allowed to draw is that all the things that you did really made a big difference even if you can kind of go back and look at the strategy and look at it in terms of what it was actually put in place to do and be like but you said you point of this was to do this other thing and it failed um so um yeah there were choices here um you know i think you can go back over a long time especially in the climate space and be like the environmental movement has just again and again and again made really bad choices that have made the politics of doing anything about any of these issues really really impossible so what I'm hearing you say is that at the top, at the scientific level, that it manifests in a kind of fudging of the data or em emphasizing certain things and, and de-emphasizing sort of the, the risks, the, the level of risk that we actually face. And then the way it trickles down to the culture is you start to, you get figures like Greta Thunberg, uh, who in the school, when we're talking about young people, this is a person who is held up as a hero, like literally at my kid's school, this is someone who is taught as a heroic figure in the schools because she is raising awareness to this uh, imminent catastrophe that is going to affect all of you uh, when you're adults. And, and so th th this is someone that you should be listening to. Um, and then the second, compo uh, you know, another component of that is this shift to well every single extreme weather event now needs to be tied to to that um and and that that's a strategy that as you mentioned in your piece goes back to an inconvenient truth we can see the poster here you've got a smokestack with a hurricane coming out of the smokestack Therefore, it looks like New Jersey every time I drive through it, honestly. <laughs> not even kidding. New, New Jersey smokes actually just emitting these hurricanes. Um, <laughs> I've We've put together a little uh, media montage uh, that I think underscores that point. So, John, could you roll that montage just because uh, then I want to ask Ted about the connection. Tells us there's a connection between hurricanes and climate change. According to a new United Nations report, the devastating impacts of human-caused climate change are happening now. It's clearly the case that climate change is making storms like this one stronger. The report lays bare multiple threats, such as weather extremes, drought, and fire that have already disrupted human life and natural ecosystems. This year we have seen all sorts of real extremes across the United States, from Hawaii uh, to Georgia. Is the average American, do you think, now starting to understand that climate change is here and having a disastrous effect? Facing the most explosive conditions they've ever seen, firefighters are losing homes and lives. There is something so fundamental that also cannot be denied, and that is climate change. What's your reaction to that kind of coverage of the issue um 
I mean, it, um, I think the most generous thing that you could say is that it is, um, exaggerating, you know, sort of by several orders of magnitude in most cases, the role that climate change is playing in these events. Um, so if you want to understand sort of like, get to the bottom of sort of, you know, how, how this works, um, you know, there's this idea and, and, and it's why I sort of give the example of that poster, <laughs> uh, for an inconvenient mm -hmm. truth, right. Which is that like we burn fossil fuels, it comes out the smokestack and it makes a hurricane. Um, and this is literally not how it works. It's just, just not how the climate system works. And it is not how, um, fossil fuel combustion and greenhouse gases are affecting the climate system. So, you know, I think the best way to think of it, um, if you want to kind of find a climate effect or you're looking for a climate effect, um, in any of these events is that it's kind of like sort of like a Russian nesting doll of risk and con contributors to that risk. So that is so much less sexy for a cable news hit, right? Like, I don't know how to fit that into a, yeah, comment. yeah, you know, exactly. a little bit more abstract like Russian nesting <laughs> dolls. I was like, yeah. what the hell is that? You know? <laughs> yeah. A um, little easier to just be like, uh, you know, climate change is imminently going to kill us all in 10 years. Right. Like that's right. very like, Makes right. you want to keep watching, right? So it's like, so it's like there's a tiny little doll at the center or at the bottom of it, which is climate change. Mm -hmm. And that climate change is a degree of warming over the last, you know, 150 years, a little bit, you know, depending on where we are in various uh, natural cycles, it could be 1.2, it could be 1.3, uh, you know, it's higher now because we're uh, had a very strong El Nino. When we go back into a La Nina cycle, it will be lower, but it's, you know, somewhere 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, once you kind of control for and everything also, else. When did we start collecting data on all of this? Well, I mean, that's a more define, recent, you know, uh, we have various proxy okay. data that goes way back, uh, ice, ice yeah. or samples and tree mm -hmm. rings and things like that. Um, you've got sort of some ver some kind of temperature like actual like you know various actual human measurements of cool. temperatures going back you know 100 plus years but you don't have you know super then you've got satellite data that's more recent and various other measurements that are more accurate and more extensive um uh that are going back more like decades but you know i don't think there's really any doubt that We've seen this warming, um, you know, it's somewhere north of a degree of warming Celsius. Um, and, um, it's primarily driven by human, um, uh, uh, greenhouse gases added to the atmosphere due to human activities, primarily the combustion of fossil fuels. So that that's when people talk about consensus climate science, that is the consensus climate science. And to be clear, the consensus stops there. Once you start talking about what this means for human societies, how it's going to like affect the weather in 2050 or 2100, there's no consensus. We don't even know how much, you know, say a doubling of atmospheric yeah. concentrations of greenhouse gases above pre-industrial levels actually will warm the planet, much less exactly how much impact that will have on climate phenomena at sort of regional scales. And then far less how much um, effect that will have on, uh, you know, how that will affect human societies. Um, so that's another kind of series of like Russian nesting dolls there, you know? I mean, to linger on the weather phenomena for a second, specifically hurricanes and just tropical cyclones, there, there's a chart in your piece that I want to bring up here that shows the number of tropical cyclones globally from 1980 through 2023. And you, uh, you pulled this from the International Best Trek Archive for Climate Stewardship. Um, and uh, th this, uh, all, uh, our regular viewers know this, but I'll just mention that all of our sources are always linked in the description for the video, so you can go check all this out. But, um, you know, this shows to me a slight decline over that 
period. So in terms of frequency, it looks like a decline, but I, I guess the proponents would argue that there's possibly a strengthening of some storms or repositioning. Well, like, there's, what, yes. what do we so, make of the cyclone question? So you were having fewer total storms, um, somewhat um, more uh, um, uh, incidents of strong uh, tropical storms. Um, and so once you balance those two things out, it's about the same in terms of strong um, uh, um, you know, really strong cyclones. And then depending on how you look and where you look and what time period, you can find various trends one way or another in terms of like land falling, strong tropical cyclones, which is kind of really the thing we care about. That's the thing that like kills mm -hmm. people and creates lots of economic costs and things like that is not just that like there's a strong tropical cyclone out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but that it like actually goes and like makes landfall somewhere where it does a lot of um, damage um, to people and to property. So, um, but you know, just to, just to kind of get to like how this really works and I'll, I'm gonna try my Russian nesting doll kind of metaphor one more time, but <laughs> you know, there's a little tiny doll called climate change. It's about a degree of warming, it has um, you know, and that manifests to varying degrees on various weather and climate phenomena. Um, but that is affecting the main thing that actually um, drives extreme weather, which is just natural variability. So to the point about the hurricane doesn't actually come out of the smoke smokestack. No climate change, you still would have lots and lots of hurricanes, lots of strong hurricanes, lots of intense rainfall, lots of very hot heat waves, all of those things. Um, and so climate change is just little, relatively small um, thing that's in, that is modestly intensifying some of these things. So the heat wave that would be, you know, 99 degrees uh, high temperatures, never below 99 degree high temperature over say five days um, is never below 101 degrees with climate change over maybe six days. Um, so it's just a, it's a, it, it, it's, it's increasing the intensity and the impact of these things at the margin. Um, um, so, and then, you know, we call that a climate hazard, right? The heat wave or the hurricane. So then the climate hazard is then just one factor in what makes a natural disaster. So the big things, like to go back to our hurricane in the Pacific, um, a strong hazard, you know, the tree that falls in the woods and nobody sees it, we don't know if the tree fell in the woods. Well, we have satellites, so we know that the tropical storm was out there. Um, but a tropical storm that never makes landfall doesn't actually have any impact. Um, so where you get a natural disaster is where a strong storm makes landfall in a place where there's lots of people um, and lots of property and various other things. Um, and then that's not, so that's not the end of it. Then the question is, well, you know, how well adapted or how resilient are the people and the infrastructure to the event that actually kind of impacts them? Um, yeah. And, and, um, so when you go look at the disaster record, like actually, like, let's look at the trends in the disasters, they are getting more expensive. Um, yeah, let me pull the, that up. Actually, I've got here, uh, from your, your, yep. um, article here, increasing damage from weather extremes and it's showing right. again, uh, you know, a pretty steady upward trajectory. Yep. Yep. Um, and you hear lots of talk about about billion yeah. dollar disasters and there's more and more billion dollars in disasters. But the thing that is just literally entirely accounts for that is not climate change. It's just more people and a lot more property and a lot more wealth that is being affected by these storms. How much of this also has to right. do with the fact that instead of taking like we we've always had the opportunity to take reasonable lessons from for example certain like wildfire prone areas of california and choosing to not build in those places but to instead build elsewhere um one way that we in a free market society manage to handle this is via insurance premiums being higher and yet somehow 
the thing that has actually happened, and I'm not totally sure the mechanisms at play here, but sometimes it's government action. It ends up being that um, these insurance companies sort of aren't charging people the premiums that they really kind of ought to be bearing. Uh, yeah, that's, that would government action here in, that's government action here in Florida where I am, where they mm -hmm. cap the insurance premiums or they're mm -hmm. subsidized by the state for the people along the coast. And it's totally screwed up the insurance, the home, do this home in insurance market. Florida, here. Florida, California, New York, it's not even like perfectly correlated to red states versus blue states. I know John Stossel wrote a piece for Reason years ago about how his beach house was very um, sort of subsidized in this way um, or that he was insulated from the true cost of it. And his beach house ended up being destroyed. But like, you know, I keep sort of coming back to this thought of like, well, wait a second. It's it's as if we felt like like there was a means of sort of pricing this risk into the cost of building like, in these places. And yet, for whatever reason, for many, many years now, we just have it. Yeah. What I mean, what that, role that, does that's that play? certainly played a role, although we should be really clear. This is happening yeah, well, all over the world. Yeah, not just like true. U.S. flood insurance or something. Um, sure, but here we at least have a sophisticated yeah, system. I mean, we know, could, in we could do better. We don't have, yeah, yeah. Although, just to get you know, just to give another example, you know, I'm in California. I live 700 feet from the Hayward Fault, um, and you know, California has chosen also to not price uh, earthquake risk uh, or require it. Um, and you know, probably if you really looked at what sort of natural events would be most sort of economically catastrophic in California would be a very large earthquake, you know, in LA or the San Francisco Bay Area on one of these fault lines. And, you know, you can kind of do counterfactuals of, well, what would, you know, if we just like required everybody to have earthquake insurance and priced it, you know, let the market price it. Yeah what would happen. And obviously policymakers in California have just decided that we're not going to do that. That, um, yeah. you know, it's very difficult to, I'm not sure what California is or looks like if you really accurately uh, priced uh, all that earthquake risk. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm not, that's not to say that we shouldn't have smarter earthquake in, in policies for insurance of all sorts, but it is to just say that like, um, you know, we kind of make, um, uh, various decisions that, um, uh, I don't know what, how do you know, it's a dangerous world and we decide yeah. how to live in it. Um, and California already has housing supply constraints. And so then what happens if you essentially, it, 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 you know, in effect, acts a quarter of the existing housing supply because right. people were priced out via insurance premiums. Yeah. Being sky high, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, the, you know, so it all gets very, and you know, like I live, I, you know, I get it. I'm at 700 feet from the Hayward fault. I live in a, a, you know, a, um, urban wildland interface, um, you know, that sooner or later is going to burn. Um, and you know, you showed the little clip about wildfires and it's like, yeah, climate change, like wildfire is one of the things where, it's a little complicated. There's a clear climate effect on wildfire weather. My colleague Patrick Brown recently did some really important work sort of showing that like actually like climate change is increasing the number of what are sort of really extreme fire days and right. days where you can have really extreme fire growth if there is a fire. But the reality is still that like most of that sort of fire risk, wildfire risk in California is two things. The first is that we've been suppressing wildfires for a hundred years. So there's this huge buildup of fuel um, mm. all over the state. And is the second is that, you know, we've moved like 30 million people into this urban wildland interface. Um, we're both at risk from wildfires and also, you know, the way that we start mostly start wildfires these days is that people start them. So you move a lot more people into these forested areas and they're going to start a lot more fires and more of those fires will get out of control and then climate change will make them worse. Um, to your um, first point, is that basically the argument that's like we need to we should have been having controlled burns and that would have been a means of heading off this problem? Yeah, or just, you know, mechanically thinning or some combination of those things. But one way or another, you man, you need to manage those fuel loads because once a fire starts, um, there's just so much more fuel um, to burn. Yeah. And at this point, and, and 
I was just going to say, I do happen to know that th there are some complicated politics as to why that didn't happen as well. That has to do with the way CAL FIRE is structured as opposed to fire management services along the East Coast. So you can also trace a line to political interest groups being Jack a problem. Jack is a recovering uh, Californian well. in case it's not a I am, yes. He yeah, logged yeah, a lot yeah. of years no, in I mean, LA. And that, that's now, true. And, you know, look, we've... You know, we still like the environmental movement in California still just absolutely and all over the West basically, you know, litigates, opposes, fights every forest yeah. management, plan, management plan that really is serious about going in and reducing fuel loads because they just see it as a proxy for logging and they're, they're against logging. Um, so in a sense, it's like the climate apocalypse, uh, uh, you know, apocalypticism <laughs> has had this um, very damaging effect of making it so that some of these strategies that could mitigate, you know, massive wildfires that are very hard to get under control, it, it's made it so that the tactics available for mitigating this are sort of no longer available politically, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you show the Gavin Newsom clip again. Again, Gavin is very, very quick to blame all of this on climate change and, you know, promised to mass, you know, sort of undertake a massive effort to get, um, you know, fuel loads and fire risk under control in the state, and they've hardly done it, anything. Um, um, and it's not all his fault, I, right? He's got this powerful environmental movement that's opposing a lot of it. Mm -hmm. He's got NEPA and CEQA, um, which are the permitting um, environmental review laws that makes it really, really difficult. Uh, we have some new analysis coming out soon looking federally at NEPA, and you hear a lot of the conversation around NEPA now around like, you know, energy infrastructure and the big fight around NEPA reform. But if you go look at, at least at the appellate level, where most of the litigation is, 70% of all of the NEPA level litigation at the appellate level is over forest management plans. Um, yeah. So, um, um, I, you know, I do, I do want to uh, not lose track of yeah. this point that we were getting to, which is there's this slide, which is the increasing economic damage from weather extremes, which you're saying is because as we've grown wealthier as a society, basically more wealth has been put in vulnerable position, weather climate vulnerable positions. But on the other hand, we have to put it next to this figure which shows the declining vulnerability to weather extremes when you take the damage as a percentage of GDP. And I, we got to unpack that a little bit because, uh, I mean, my understanding of this graph, which you can refine uh, if I am getting it wrong, is that, yes, well, more total wealth is being damaged. We're also a much richer society. So the if you take that as a percentage of how rich we are as a society, it's been going down. Uh, so in a sense, we are more resilient than ever against these uh, these events. Is that more or less an accurate summary? That that is that that that's an accurate summary. So if you look at the absolute damage, the absolute cost, it's going up. If you look at the um uh at the cost as a as a share of total GDP, it's going down. Um, and then if you look at the cost, you know, you take a more granular approach and you, and that's what this last graph you're showing is, and you look at the cost as a share of exposed GDP. Um, and this is within 250 miles, um, of a climate related, uh, disaster. It's fallen by a factor of four, um, massively. Hmm. And that those things are related, like you know, more help, wealth in harm's way, it's, it's, it's tends to be property. That's a lot more resilient. So, right. um, you know, you go look at like Miami beach today versus, you know, a hundred years ago, and there's a lot, lot more wealth there, but you look at steel and concrete, um, and that stuff is really, really resilient much more resilient than sort of, you know, wood frame buildings and mud shacks and the kinds of things that were sort of tended to get sort of totally leveled and destroyed. So, you know, there's a lot less GDP, but a lot more of it would get destroyed in these storms, um, you know, in the U.S. 100 years ago or in still poor countries uh, today. And so you'll probably show this slide too, but when you really go and look at um, 
the human cost, not just the economic cost. And the best measure we have of that is just yeah. how many people are dying in these events. On a per capita basis, it's fallen by a factor of almost 50. Yeah. And that almost certainly understates the degree uh, to which people are much more safer, even in poor countries today. Uh, from yeah, climate seems important community. to consider when you're con when you're thinking about how worried or anxious should I be about this to look at the fact that you're almost the likelihood of anyone in dying. the United States dying in a climate related disaster of any sort is vanishingly small. Well, so I'm really curious, like on that note, it, like if you were talking to a young person who is really, really afraid of what might happen in the future with regard to climate change, how would you uh, reassure them? What would you tell them? You know, would you tell them your fears are totally off base? I mean, I'm no, I'm no psychologist. So, um, uh, but I, I, I'll say this, um, I'm not a psychologist, but you know, I've read quite a bit and written a bit about and the say they're open to this, this stuff. And see, they just like want, they want you to tell them the truth about it. But currently they've very much fed the narrative, like they've been fed the narrative and they've really believed it. Yeah. I mean, again, I think you have to, I mean, certainly for like a lot of young people, again, you have to kind of go and understand that just uh, climate change and, and in part because, um, you know, uh, a set of sort of actors have sort of gone out of their way to try to connect these things. Um, but it's also just sort of a thing that this sort of more generalized anxiety um, and fear has attached itself to. But I think one of the things that's really interesting, you know, so now we have this whole kind of cottage industry of like people who are doing like climate psychology and therapy and things like that. And it's literally like, antithetical to like everything that we know about what works in therapy, right? Because we kind of go to like cognitive, you know, just a basic kind of cognitive theory of sort of cognitive behavioral theory, therapy, like the idea is like, I come in and I'm like, everybody hates me. And the therapist's job is to kind of um, carefully sort of um, help you learn how to talk back to that, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, this really is everybody hate you. Well, okay. I like John. My dog likes me. Okay, great. You know, so your dog doesn't hate you. That's a good start. And let's kind of work from there. Um, uh, and in the climate space, what these sort of cog climate therapists are doing is the opposite. They're like, you're totally right to be completely terrified about this. And let's talk about how you're going to kind of live and survive and make your life in the midst of this apocalypse um, mm -hmm. that you're living through. Um, this is just terrible. This is just terrible therapy and, and sort of a whole lot of the conversation with this at a cultural level is happening, um, in that way as well. So what would you say to the young person? Well, it's the sort of first, just sort of, you know, kind of given some information. Well, about so give me, give me the information, Chuck, like give me, so say I come to you and yeah. I'm like, Ted, I am 20 years old. We're suspending disbelief for a moment. Ted, I'm 20 years old. I'm really, really worried that in the next 10 years, the next 20 years, my life is going to be a total disaster because of climate change and the impact that's going to have on my home, New York City. You know, say you had the opportunity to, in like 60 seconds or less, lay out the real truth of the science at a very high level. How would you, you know, help them get over these fears? Not from a psychological standpoint, but like what's actually happening? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say something like, you know, yes, the climate is changing uh, and it's going to continue to change. Mm -hmm. um, but you are actually safer from climate impacts of all sorts than any human being in the entire history of the human species has ever been. Um, and um, even rising sea levels, like even all of that. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, so, you know, sea levels are going to rise. Um, they are rising. They're going to continue to rise. But when you look at how much they're going to rise, um, you know, they've risen, oh, you know, something less than a foot over the last like 150 years, um, you know, in sort of kind of a sort of something close to a worst case 
um, you know, by the end of this century, they'll, you'll see a couple more feet of sea level rise. And, you know, that, that there's a lot of variance there just because of the topographies of different places. But overall, on average, that's what you're looking at. And the hurricanes aren't going to get like so much worse and so much more frequent and just absolutely demolish us, absolutely batter us every single hurricane season. No, I mean, um, so first of all, climate change works in two ways on hurricanes. It will make them more intense in some ways, um, mostly because uh, a warmer climate holds more water vapor, which means you'll get more extreme precipitation. Um, but you also get... Um, uh, uh, there's a lot of evidence that you get uh, more wind shear with a warmer climate, which actually kind of makes it harder for strong hurricanes to form and to sustain. Um, so that may be one of the reasons that we're actually seeing a decline in overall tropical cyclone uh, incidents um, is because even though like they can hold more moisture, um, they can't sustain the kinds of wind speeds. And, and when you look at what really does most of the damage in a landfalling hurricane. It's actually the high winds. It's not the rainfall. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, on sea level rise, I mean, just to give another example of like the ways in which we don't really factor in the human role here. Like I'm looking out at, um, you know, the San Francisco Bay right now. And the San Francisco Bay shoreline um, and the urban agglomeration that is built up like it uh, around it is like a lot of very urbanized areas which is a huge amount of it is built on landfill uh, well, in other words if i was sitting where i'm sitting today um uh you know 150 years ago the san francisco bay would be about a third larger than it is today um, wow so we've gone and really literally reclaimed huge amounts of land from the San Francisco Bay over hmm. the last 150 years. And this is true in New York and and um, Florida and most places. Um, you know, what is probably going to happen to one degree or another over the next couple of hundred years is that we're gonna, a bunch of that land is gonna get reclaimed by the sea. Um, and it's not going to happen not even remotely all at once. It's going to happen very slowly. Oops. And some of those places will decide are so valuable that we're going to build seawalls and other infrastructure to defend it, which we already do and have done for a long time in low-lying areas, including New York. So you go down to lower Manhattan, there's seawalls and whatever. And that property is so valuable that we will spend a lot of money to defend <laughs> it for a long, long time against the rising sea. In other places, ultimately, we'll probably be like, all right, you know, like some housing and some property and some structures, people are going to move. Um, people have moved into those areas over the last 150 years. For the most part, they're continuing to move into those areas. I mean, one of the misperceptions is that we're already in this era of sort of climate driven migration where people, because of climate impacts, are fleeing this extreme climate. And it's really not true. In fact, the overwhelming direction of migratory travel is still actually towards the climate risks. It's no. in to, to coastal areas. It's into, uh, you know, river, uh, flood riverine areas and low and, and flood prone prone areas. So what's Florida. happening, people are moving towards the hazard. I'm guilty Not of this too. I migrated from Brooklyn, where I was, you know, nice and insulated, relatively safe for a New Yorker, to now I live sandwiched between the Jamaica Bay, so at the very, very southernmost part of New York City and Queens, sandwiched between the Jamaica Bay on one side, which I can see from my kitchen window, and the ocean on the other side. And so rising sea level, it's like, it'll all just like come yeah. flooding over me and I'll just surf my way out of it. But no, I mean, legitimately, I think Zach and I are both good examples of people moving towards the risky areas in the last few years. Yeah, well, and that's been happening for a century. Yeah, yeah well, and I think that Liz's uh, earlier point about insurance reform as like kind of boring and wonky as that sounds like probably will have to play a role uh more of a role going forward to like actually price in these kind of risks but um i you know i let's stay in the mindset of the sort of anxious 20 something and bring forward a few of the specific fears and objections that 
people have about this. And I think one way to do that would be to go back to what you say is the genesis of the, the ratcheting up effect with uh, an inconvenient truth. Um, I, I want to play two clips from that. The first one is Al Gore talking about uh, glaciers and ice caps, because you hear a lot about the effect that the melting ice is going to have on the rest of, of the planet. And he made some pretty specific predictions in that movie. So let's play that clip, John, and reflect on it. It just keeps going up. It is relentless. And now we're beginning to see the impact in the real world. This is Mount Kilimanjaro more than 30 years ago and more recently. And a friend of mine just came back from Kilimanjaro with a picture he took a couple months ago. Another friend, Lonnie Thompson, studies glaciers. Here's Lonnie with a last sliver of one of the once mighty glaciers. Within the decade, there will be no more snows of Kilimanjaro. This is happening in Glacier National Park. I climbed to the top of this in 1998 with one of my daughters. Within 15 years, this will be the park formerly known as Glacier. Here is what's been happening year by year to the Columbia Glacier. It just retreats every single year. And it's a shame because these glaciers are so beautiful. But those who go up to see them, here's what they're seeing every day now. Um, so I do want to just point out that um, the within the decade, there will be no more snows of Kilimanjaro is not quite accurate. There's a picture of Kilimanjaro from uh, last year. Um, and then um, the glacier park, uh, their glaciers have shrunk. Uh, but again, the prediction that they would disappear has not come to fruition. This article about it from Montana Public Radio notes that in 2020, they had to change the signs warning that the glaciers would disappear by 2020. That being said, there has been, um, you know, a decrease in the ice caps. I pulled some pictures of this is the uh, from NASA, the uh, sea ice in March of 2024. You can kind of see a red outline around the edge where the median edge was from 1981 to 2010. And there's some corners where there's been some retreat. It's definitely not a, a total disappearance. Same with Antarctica. You can see this, uh, that some of the edges of Antarctica have basically melted away. So how concerned should we be about uh, this glacial retreat? Because that's a big thing you hear about is the um, you know, the polar ice caps melting and causing all sorts yeah, of I mean, sea rise. So a warmer planet is going to have less ice on it, just full stop. Um, and, you know, we are probably going to lose a lot of our, of the sort of, um, terrestrial, um, you know, kind of the glaciers like in, in Montana and places like that. Um, and that stuff we, you know, we'll lose a lot of that this century probably. Um, but that will have, like, if you're talking about like sea level rise, that will have very almost un, um, observable impacts on sea level. The main event in terms of sea level, to some degree, it's the Greenland ice cap and really it's the Antarctic yeah. ice caps. Um, and those are also going to melt, um, to varying degrees. And, you know, you can kind of get various sort of studies in climate science that says there, are, you know, I mean, there's some that says we're already close to sort of a, a tipping point where the loss of the Greenland ice sheet um, entirely is inevitable. Um, but the thing you have to realize is that um, when you look at like the time period over which that is going to happen, um, it's like a 800 to 1,000 years. Um, so, and that's yeah. Greenland it will take much, much longer for Antarctica. So, you know, warming two, three degrees, whatever warming, and then it stays like that for a really long time. Um, uh, at some point, thousands of years from now, you could have an ice-free planet. Um, mm -hmm. But the time scales that we're talking about are just enormous. Um, and like a lot of things, the idea that anyone has any idea 
insofar as there are existential risks to human survival on the planet over those kind of time periods, I don't think you would put like climate change and melting ice sheets very high on that list. Um, okay. Like, but but yeah. You know, I mean, in the more but in, I mean, in the more immediate future, uh, you know, you've mentioned tipping points. This is something that you hear a lot of fear about. It's mentioned in the documentary. I've got another clip that we're going to play a second in a second about a potential tipping point involving that Greenland ice shelf that Al Gore laid out. Um, th these are the scenarios that I think really scare people is, are we going to pass some sort of point where it's this reinforcing cycle where it just starts you know, boiling out of control and like some fundamental, really fast shift happens because of that self-reinforcing process. So, uh, John, can you roll the tipping points clip from An Inconvenient Truth? They tell us, the scientists do, that the Earth's climate is a nonlinear system, just a fancy way they have of saying that the changes are not all just gradual. Some of them come suddenly in big jumps. At the end of the last ice age, as the last glacier was receding from North America, the ice melted and a giant pool of fresh water formed in North America. And the Great Lakes are the remnants of that huge lake. An ice dam on the eastern border formed and one day it broke. And all that fresh water came rushing out, ripping open the St. Lawrence there and it diluted the salty, dense, cold water, made it fresher and lighter, so it stopped sinking, and that pump shut off, and the heat transfer stopped, and Europe went back into an ice age for another 900 to 1,000 years. And the change from conditions like we have here today to an ice age took place in perhaps as little as 10 years' time. So that's a sudden jump. Now, of course, that's not going to uh, happen again because the glaciers of North America are not there. And is there any other big chunk of ice anywhere near there? Oh, yeah. If Greenland broke up and melted, or if half of Greenland and half of West Antarctica <laughs> broke up and melted, this is what would happen to the sea level in Florida. <laughs> This is what would happen to San Francisco Bay. A lot of people live in these areas. The Netherlands, one of the low countries, absolutely devastating. The area around Beijing that's home to tens of millions of people. Even worse, in the area around Shanghai, there are 40 million people. They can measure this precisely, just as the scientists could predict precisely how much water would breach the levees in New Orleans. The area where the World Trade Center Memorial is to be located would be underwater. Is it possible that we should prepare against other threats besides terrorists? Maybe we should be concerned about other problems as well. I like oh, that in his uh, portrayal guess... of New York City, all the rest of it, like New York has a ton of coastline and yet all the rest of it's untouched. Like nothing happens to Brooklyn Navy Yard. Nothing happens <laughs> to Rockaway. Like, yeah. Well, you Manhattan know, uh, I think it's important to re I think it's important to remember that this is, you know, uh, at this point, Al Gore is living in the shadow of George W. Bush, who, you know, he was supposed to beat in the election and George W. Bush has become like the terrorism president. And so referencing the World Trade Center is, you know, a, a kind of direct like, well, what about this other really important issue? But I mean, the scenario he lays out uh, is pretty frightening. This idea that within a decade, you could just be plunged into Europe could be plunged into an ice age um, uh, and it can just happen like that. Uh, like, are, are you underestimating that kind of existential risk? Uh, that there's this just, might be on the horizon. Just, there's just, you know, these claims are recycled again and again and again. Um, and you get a paper or whatever, and everyone goes, oh my God, the, you know, the North Atlantic, uh, you know, circulation is, is slowing down because of the ice melt in Greenland. And, 
And, um, you know, and then like, you know, wiser heads, um, or, you know, kind of people go and, and there's just not much evidence for it. Um, uh, nor is there much evidence that, um, uh, you know, so for instance, like the big lake in North America, that happens over like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and then mm. you get this ice dam that breaks and this rapid thing that happens. Um, but like at this mm. point, we you're are saying that the lead, about, you're saying that the lead, you're the lead up to the ice dam breaking yeah. would be something we'd be able yeah. to observe like, and like anticipate. There is right. no lake in North America like this. Yeah. Nor is there a lake like this in Greenland or in West Antarctica. Um, mm -hmm. So, and and anything like that would take hundreds of years. Anything capable of having that kind of effect when a dam, whatever, broke, um, would right. take hundreds and hundreds of years to form. Um, there seems to be this very consistent um, sort of underrating of human ingenuity and our ability to engineer and build our way out of these problems, which I don't say to dismiss the concerns. Like, like to some degree, I think there's maybe more credence, more validity to the idea that like really, really poor places along the massive, massive coastline in Indonesia will be very negatively impacted by this, right? Like that I think is the best mm. possible version of that argument. But I find it a lot harder to believe the version of that argument that's like, oh, we will face, you know, imminent disaster in the United States, when in reality, we have a lot of experience with building, um, you know, along Earth, like you were even talking about, like the shift toward using steel and concrete as building materials. And then I even see this, though I don't have excellent data on it in my own neighborhood in New York, where I see increasingly the newer construction houses and the, um, you know, a lot of the newer development, it's just built up higher. Uh, in part because we were hit really, really hard by Hurricane Sandy out here. And so even if we're not, you know, that worried about rising um, sea level, there is still a sense of when when there are when there is torrential downpour, when hurricanes do hit, it is useful to make sure that you're not going to have basement flooding. And so as a result, more and more things are being built on stilts. And it's a type of thing where it's not happening all at once. It's not as if every house is being lifted up. It's not as though every family has the money to do that. But you do notice this slow gravitating toward these approaches that do mitigate a lot of the damage. And I wonder, like, is there a reason, is it like antagonism to market forces that's leading to people underrating our ability to engineer a way out of this? Or is there some other thing that I'm not understanding? Um, I mean, I'm putting aside market forces or even, you know, there's lots of public things yeah. that we do that also True. make us much safer. And I think that all of these things, I mean, even your example of Indonesia, it assumes that Indonesia, everyone, all those people are going to stay poor. Yeah, um, that's true. And, that's a great corrective. Right? You're right. And like, we know that's not what's happening. Yeah. Um, and even for people who are still quite poor, they're much more resilient um, yeah. than they were a few decades ago, just because they have access to all sorts of technology and just basic public health things. Sure. and out libertarian me out libertarianing me uh, i think because i totally you know under like sold short the fact that like truly <laughs> like you know rising living standards might legitimately make it so that indonesia has a far more massive middle class than i could have anticipated but, right? you know bangladesh I mean, which is like the poster yeah. child yeah. or poor people sort of in the way of rising seas and storms and whatever well if you just go look at the um casualties um, deaths from strong cyclones in, in Bangladesh over the last 50 years. You know, in 1970, her, uh, Cyclone Bola killed somewhere between a half million and a million people in Indonesia. I mean, in, uh, in uh, Bangladesh. Um, no strong storm in the last 20 years has killed maybe even like 100 people <laughs> in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And Bangladesh, that's in part because Bangladesh is still compared to us a poor country but it's actually much much wealthier <laughs> and there's all sorts of measures that they have taken and there's better forecasts and even poor people have cell phones and things like that so there's just so much more ability to prepare you know like like you would get these storms historically where like literally no one knew the storm was there until like literally it's on top of them and that <laughs> literally doesn't happen anymore. 
Um, I noticed. So, I, I noticed in that clip that uh, you were kind of scoffing at Gore's uh, assertion that uh, there's this there was this sort of scientific precision about when the levees would break in New Orleans, and you know Katrina was really his one of his central examples in that movie of like this is what you can start to expect more of if we don't do something. Um, what? Why was? Why were you reacting? That I mean, way? I, because because like. Um, you know, Hurricane Katrina was not a, a particularly exceptional storm. Um, mm -hmm. It was kind of, I wouldn't say garden variety. I mean, it was a category three hurricane that hit a major city. Um, but um, but there was not really, uh, there's no real climate change signal there. It's just a strong hurricane hitting a place where there were a lot of poor people and a lot of, you know, that was very low lying and dependent on infrastructure that hadn't, you know, sort of had been criminally neglected, um, you know, by both the federal government and local authorities. So we knew we don't we didn't need a lot of climate fancy. Cli There's no need for a lot of fancy climate science to tell us like where the water in New Orleans in 2003 was going to go if the levees broke or 2005, I guess it was, um, you know, if the levees failed and the. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, like, like we'd known that for, for many, many decades, we just didn't maintain the levees. Yeah. The, I mean, the, I mean, this the, is an example is where... of how outrageous some of this stuff is where, where Gore wants you to think that this is climate change. It's not climate change. Um, right. It's just, it's just, you know, failing institutions, not doing really basic things to protect mm -hmm. people from natural hazards that are quite dangerous with or without climate change. But this is where we run into the sort of central paradox of the environmentalist approach to this, yeah. because if if we're all in agreement that there's going to be some warming and some sea rise that comes with that warning, warming, then what part what you're saying is that we need to have increased resilience in these these poorer countries especially need to have that. And really the only way to get that is through a lot of money to invest in that sort of resilience. But then uh, if the, tr so the trade-off we're facing here is how much to cut fossil fuels um, and transition to other forms of energy that are not emitting carbon, but that, currently those forms of energy are more expensive and so sort of undermines that project of building more resilience into the future. So how do you think about that trade-off? Like what is, um, I, I know it's a, I realize it's a very complicated question, but how do you um, balance cutting CO2 emissions versus future economic growth? Is there a, a good formula for that? Yeah, I mean, Look, you know, we actually know how to make people a lot more resilient to climate change. Um, and that is, um, you know, development, infrastructure, institutions, you know, like emergency response, planning, build the seawall. Hey, you know, Gore is right. We know where we need to build the levees and the seawalls and the flood channels and things like that. And the in the, um, you know, flood control, uh, infrastructure, um, you know, and, and increasingly wealthy societies can do this. Uh, and the U S has been doing this for like over a hundred years. Um, there's this idea that it, you know, that, okay, fine. But the real thing here is we need to go like turn this climate knob so that these things won't happen. And first of all, turning the climate knob won't make these things not happen. It may make them somewhat less intense. And secondly, there's not a big climate knob that we have any very good idea how to turn um, at any, um, mm. you know, kind of uh, with any precision or with any confidence. Um, and it's certainly even turning it takes a really, really long time. So I think there's good arguments for why we would want to, over time, decarbonize the global economy. A lot of that has to do with the impacts that climate change is going to sort of have on the rest of the natural world, as opposed to human societies. 
Um, and, you know, like I would like, you know, uh, for I would like to still have like fog in the Bay Area, you know, in 50 years when I probably won't be alive, but whatever um, uh, for future <laughs> residents here and so on. I mean, there's there's lots of kind of non catastrophic reasons to kind of go like, yeah, it would be nice to have a more temperate climate um, as opposed to a less temperate climate. Um, but um, uh, and, you know, there are trade offs, but even, you know, there's certainly like like literally like you know the main thing that we're supposed to do um which is uh you know to build a lot of wind and solar panel you know solar energy yeah. and then sort of electrify everything and like if you kind of go look at the things that make people really resilient to climate change you can't do it mostly that way or if you can it's entirely almost theoretical so you know um it's really, really hard to make steel without coal at this point. Um, you can kind of do it, but it's really expensive. It's really, really hard to make concrete without fossil energy um, uh, because it's sort of an input, not just in terms of like the heat and the power, but also like the chemical process that you're using to make it. Um, uh, you know, if we could figure out how to really cheaply make a lot of hydrogen without fossil energy, then we could figure out how to produce a lot of synthetic fertilizer at sort of roughly the same cost. <laughs> uh, but actually, we don't really know how to do that um, in any economically scalable way. And those are the things. You're saying like, there's massive trade-offs that a lot of climate activists are just simply not contending with. Yes. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. That that that's well, a... let, let, yeah. Let, let me look at uh, just to kind of bring this to a close. I want to look at what is being done at the moment. This is a graph from our world in data, uh, looking at the uh, annual CO two emissions from some random, not quite randomly selected countries. I selected the US, Europe, and China. And you see a decline in both uh, Europe and the US in CO2 emissions over the past uh, at least two decades, uh, even more so for Europe. Uh, and then, of course, uh, quite a spike in China. Um, and then uh, we've got the latest, I the latest IPCC report their projection for near-term warming, their best estimate is seems to range between 1.5 and 1.6 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then they've got a range, a uh, very likely range that goes up to uh, almost two degrees Celsius. Um, if we agree on all that data, what would you suggest as what are actual useful steps that we should be taking at this point to deal with this future. So if you go back to the, I think the last chart you showed, which is these IPCC estimates of yeah. sort of what's the warming we're on track for. So the first thing you need to do with this is you need to throw out the last two, 7.0 and 8.5. Okay. Um, Why? What does that mean? Because these are predicated on future emissions that like almost everyone agrees are just implausible. Um, okay. Like, like, like it just assumes just basically a massive increase in the amount of coal we're burning. And this is just not happening. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's unlikely yeah. to happen. Um, so I mean, like I this, already threw the, out these SSP other columns. Nobody, yeah. almost nobody anymore says, well, this is actually a kind of plausible um, future scenario for the global economy and global emissions. Um, and 7.0 similarly as well. So then if you go to the, the middle one there, that SS, SSP uh, 4.5, that really at this point is basically like the worst case scenario. And mm -hmm. you get out to 2100 and you see that range 2.1 to 3.5 degrees. To get to 3.5 degrees, you have to have pretty, pretty outlier um, climate sensitivity, which is just how much warming you get with an increase in the atmosphere concentration of CO2. 
Um, yeah. So really, and I mean, I mean really does the uncertainty where... does the uncertainty increase the further out you get? Like, um, you know, projecting forward to twenty one hundred, that seems a little. Yeah, like, I mean, it's high, it's all uncertain, but you know, I think there's sort of some bounding and some narrowing of what we think the the, the climate sensitivity is. Um, yeah. And you know, as a general kind of thing, I'm just kind of like, you know, these central estimates and with science like this are usually kind of the best thing to, to count on. But the real point is that like, really, even in a worst case scenario, you're probably looking at about three degrees of warming from, you know, again, mm -hmm. 1.3 or so. Now, um, there's a lot of good reason to think that actually we're going to be on a better trajectory of that. My view is that we're likely to end up at somewhere between two and two and a half degrees um, by the end of the century of warming. Um, you know, I would rather that we weren't, that didn't happen, but I also don't think that there, it's very difficult to get to real catastrophic kind of outcomes for human societies within that time frame with that amount of warming. So um, why has Greta's, Greta Thunberg's whole grift uh, been so successful? Is it serious? Like, is it legitimately just a, an, if it bleeds, it leads. It sounds like you're painting a much more moderate, like the, the portrait that you're painting is not, we should be totally unconcerned or we should not care about the, the world in which we live or ecological diversity or the environments um, that give us so much, but rather you're saying, hey, there have been changes. There will be some more changes. We will probably do this mixture of building our way out of it, adapting. We're more resilient. Our societies are more resilient than many people claim. So why is it that the Greta Thunberg perspective is the one that resonates with people? I mean, you have to be clear that it doesn't resonate with everybody. Fair it, enough. It, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the, the kind of climate movement and kind of that kind of apocalyptic climate fear, it, it's really a kind of hothouse, um, uh, you know, pun intended, uh, phenomenon. Um, <laughs> you know, that these are kind of, you know, you know, if you kind of go like environmentalism in some ways is sort of the secular religion of sure. sort of the post-industrial educated sort of knowledge classes in, in wealthy societies. That's who's freaked out. Um, mm -hmm. and you look at all the people with climate anxiety and that's who it is. Um, and Greta is See, literally the poster Maslow's child. hierarchy of needs. All of the other needs have been satisfied. Yeah. To the yeah. Now and then you get so what, the last thing, the most, you know, the, the, the kind of, the kind of highest level of actualization apparently is to get super freaked out about climate change. <laughs> um, because you have like literally nothing else to worry about and you're still like really anxious and and can't and and in part because you can't figure out what you're supposed to be doing in the world because there's no actual um sort of material struggle anymore and so you look at greta and it's like literally she's super depressed long before she ever focuses on climate change she says it herself she's like she's like mentally ill like you know and starving herself and she actually finds meaning in the world in her climate catastrophism. And this is the thing. Greta's climate activism saves her from her sort of just generalized, like pre-adolescent depression. Yeah. Um, um, and, um, you know, it just, you have to kind of think about like, like, you know, what's kind of going on here you know, you have this environmental movement that basically is like, no, no, we have this climate science and we have to pay attention to the climate science. And then who does it elevate and tell us we need to listen to about climate risk? A Children, literal non-scientist child. Science fiction writers and novelists. And the New York Times just like a week ago puts like a 2000 word essay from a novelist on the opinion page. It's like the entire page practically to tell us, you know, basically falsehoods about climate change and climate risk. Um, so these are now the the authorities and like you literally, the, the sort of standard sort of communication, the stuff that kind of, you know, bleeds on the front pages, all of that is just typically kind of pretty disconnected at this point from what the actual mainstream 
well-established evidence on any of these questions uh, actually uh, actually shows. I mean, I suppose the and Greta it, Thunberg activist statements are the ones that can mo be most easily distilled into children's books, like the types that Zach was talking about, where his kids are being taught this in school. Or, you know, I even go to the Queen's Public Library with my kid and, you know, Greta, he can read the little board book for toddlers about Greta's successful activism. And it's like, it's so much easier to distill that into a, you know, seven page board book or into a lesson for five year olds than it is to actually communicate that there's no such thing really as the science or there's very limited scientific consensus. And then there's a lot of um, more nuanced stuff where we can only say with a certain degree of confidence what is happening, right? Like you get into much thornier places when you actually do believe the science in part because there's not really much of, there's not such a thing as the science really. And most scientists have the- I don't think it's that it's that. easier to distill down. I think that there's an intentional effort to kind of like, like just, you know, kind of, not only reduce it, but but misrepresent it and then sort of weaponize children sure. um, in the fight about climate yeah. change. And if they happen to like end up with crippling anxiety as a result of it, well, that's just, uh, you know, kind of um, the cost of war. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, and see, like the, the sort of disturbing, one of the disturbing things about your piece is that you imply or actually lay out that there's, to, to some degree, this has been like a top-down effort. Uh, you you mentioned this woman Naomi Oreskes. I don't know if I'm pronouncing Oreskes, her name yeah. correctly, but Oreskes. Uh, and this, I uh, basically the idea from the scientists at the top that in science usually we want to have a certain level of certainty to to start asserting things. Uh, but there's been this deliberate attempt to say, let's not hold to that standard of evidence anymore. Um, I, the, the reason that worries me is that we're already having a crisis of trust in our scientific institutions. And when you're playing those sorts of games, um, it's, it's your, you know, I think that the, the idea of the noble lie in the digital age has kind of been debunked and that we, like it's it's not a viable strategy uh, anymore. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, well, first, uh, do you have any you know further comments on that, on, on Naomi Oreskes or the, the work that's been done, like to the, the degree that this is actually a deliberate top down campaign? Yeah, I mean, you just have to understand that like the environmental movement or climate movement, whatever label you want to put it on now, it, it is literally the wealthiest, most powerful social movement in human history. Uh, there's a there's a New York Times there's a there was a New York Times story about a University of Indiana study um, this uh, that came out this last fall um, that finds that um, uh, the climate climate philanthropy just in the U.S. is is spending between eight and nine billion dollars a year on climate advocacy. It's a hmm. stunning amount of money. You can go, well, what about the fossil fuel industry? But the fossil fuel industry may have larger revenues, but it is not spending, you know, that's that's revenues. That's not profit, much less how much of that profit it's actually dedicating to sort of political advocacy of all kinds, much less doing anything on climate change. Well, this is nine billion dollars that is sort of purely in one shape or another advocacy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so and I, I mean, I, like, I've got to imagine that's crowding out a lot of other environmental causes as well. Um, yeah, no, no. In fact, the oxygen, um, yeah. there's another uh, recent story uh, where like a bunch of the environmental, the big national uh, environmental groups, um, you know, all sort of despite all this money that's flowing into the space had budget crises and had to lay people off. And where they laid everybody off was in a bunch of other areas of their uh, of their programs and advocacy because they're like all the money's for climate change now. Yeah, well, that, that that let me ask one final question along those lines then, because I know you you care about the environment. You're someone who's been involved with the environmentalist movement for a long time. You're one of the co-creators of this concept called eco modernism. Um, you know, th there are a lot of really important environmental issues. Uh, climate change is one of many of those. How would you, you know, if if you 
were sort of laying out a future for a more focused and effective environmental movement over the next five or 10 years, what would those priorities look like and what would we be doing differently? Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, first of all, it's, you know, direction of travel is more important than the destination when we get there. So we would sort of stop obsessing about these sort of completely, you know, frankly, arbitrary um, climate temperature targets and emissions targets and just kind of go like, let's see if we can, you know, if you look at one of the interesting things is that if you look at the long term trajectory of carbon intensity of the global economy, none of this stuff has had any impact on any of it. Um, mm. So you can go back 40, 50 years um, and the carbon intensity of the global economy basically unchanged all the way back to the oil shocks of the early 70s when there is a real inflection. Um, so like, like the first thing would be like, let's just sort of see if we can kind of make some smart investments in technology and infrastructure, um, you know, that aren't crazy, you know, a trillion dollars in a decade to uh, where it now becomes apparent, like not actually change the trajectory very much, but just like, let's make some investments in technology and infrastructure and see if we can start to, you know, bend that curve a little bit more in, in some places. And that, long-term carbon intensity trajectory. Interestingly, um, you know, it's the same in the U.S. as it is globally. You can go back many decades and, and the historic trend line, you know, you kind of go above it or below it because of other various macroeconomic factors. But, you know, over the, over the long term, it's a pretty linear uh, trajectory. And that trajectory, you know, is not bad. You know, that trajectory, if we could just stay on it, you know, gets us to like net zero emissions, not in 2050, but certainly, you know, in the latter half of this century. Um, and in the meantime, you know, we need to take adaptation more seriously. And the most important thing in, in terms of adaptation, you know, outside of places that are already rich, like the United States, is just development. Poor countries need to develop. And if they need to like, you know, kind of have more fossil fuel consumption and, um, uh, um, uh, infrastructure to do that, that is just far more important in terms of making human societies resilient to climate change. Um, and then, you know, we need to keep an eye on other things, right? Like, like if we do it all with renewable energy, there's going to be huge land use impacts and huge impacts in terms of additional mining, uh, that's necessary to do it because they're not very dense sources of energy and Renewable energy can play a role, but we'll probably need, we should be trying to do more with nuclear energy um, and just even just the sort of leaning into the coal to gas transition instead of pretending like gas is, a, is, is as bad as coal, which is just not. So I think there's a kind of uh, more incremental sort of meliorist approach here that would be much more sustainable and would get us much better results and wouldn't kind of result in this tunnel vision when we where we often do things that actually are really counterproductive, you know, economically, politically, um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, especially like when you look at what we're doing and the various restrictions on development finance for poor countries, um, you know, we're really uh, um, uh, uh, obstructing a lot of really important development globally that that really needs to happen for a lot of reasons. Ted Nordhaus, thanks for joining us today. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.